Good morning, everyone. Happy Boxing Day. Welcome to a very cloudy and wind-filled morning here in the Sabi Sands in South Africa. I am Noelle, and on camera we have Ferg. Hello, Ferg. And this is Safari Live. We are live. We are interactive. You can follow us on hashtag Safari Live on the Twitter or on YouTube chat. Now, we're not quite sure what we're up to this morning. We did have a big, beautiful male elephant to show you, and then and of course, as Murphy would have it, have it, off he goes into the thick bushes and we cannot see him anymore. Part of it has to do with this wind and part of it is he knows exactly when we start doing countdown in my ear and then I swear he giggles to himself and just moves away and then we can't see him. So our, our kind of tentative plan, not really a plan, the sticks were seen around Chitwa Chitwa area, vessels area yesterday. So I'm hoping what they're going to do is instead of move west over to um, Eratusa, uh, which is far to our west over here that they're going to move north into our area so we're just checking a little bit of our western boundary area and then we're going to check our southern boundary area and then we're going to see whether or not any of our cheeky little leopards will pop up as uh, scott's going to see if maybe tundi's around and maybe the cubs around after our epic sighting last night of that little cub finally poking his head out and then playing with mum with um but we'll see you never know we might get something amazing and or today might just be trees and birds we'll have to wait and see now, while we're waiting to see what happens with Scott's adventures, you all are going to be with me on my vehicle with my adventures. And it is going to involve, hopefully, some tracking if we can find some tracks. But also, maybe we come up with some more Ellie's. There's loads of Ellie's on the property yesterday. Um, we did get some rain last night, so our Christmas gift yesterday was all those wonderful sightings that we had. And then last night, the Bush's Christmas gift was a little bit of rain, which was good. Now, it looks as if it might rain again sometime today. I don't think maybe too much this morning. Well, actually, I'm holding thumbs not too much this morning. I really don't want to get wet on game drive today. I know that's a horrible thing to say, but it's true. I really think that it just needs to wait. Lady Starfire saying you posted a picture of Tesla with all of us, the Christmas photo. I can't wait to see it when I get done with Drive. Thanks so much for letting us know and I hope your family is good and you're good and you all had a very a wonderful Christmas day and I hope everyone else had a very wonderful Christmas day. I was very surprised. I got a phone call last night. Um, my whole family was at home and they watched the show last night which is super exciting. Um, they they no, don't really get a chance all the time to see it so that was my my little personal Christmas gift. So thanks mom and John, John and all my siblings. And I think maybe, just maybe, we're gonna have a little bit of luck with this cheeky leopard Tundi and her super cute cub. So let's head on over to Scott and see what he has to say. Sadly, no joy with Tundi and her little cub. I popped into the den already and there was no sign of Tundi. Now beginning to search for her or anybody else or anything else, not anybody, any other animal really. My name is Scott, so I'm teamed up with Enzo on camera and as I'm sure you've gathered it's a bit of a cloudy miserable morning here. But we actually need miserable weather and as much as I'd hate for rain during the safari we can't be fussy because it is abnormally dry at this time of the year so any little bits of rain we can get will be appreciated and much needed. So, um, Noel's going to be checking the western portion of our property, I'm going to be checking the eastern portion and hopefully between the two of us we'll come up with something. I'm guessing she's already mentioned but I'll just reiterate it's just the two of us out this morning. There's no feeds from the Mara, they are getting a morning off today. So we'll just be doing a three-hour safari based from the Sabi Sands. Now we did get a little bit of rain last night, so I'm not too sure how much, um, which is great for the vegetation. And it's not really great for finding tracks of animals. The, the, the sand tends to kind of solidify, the, the rain almost kind of glues it together and until a few vehicles have driven along the roads and churned everything up and created a fine powder again, 
It means if a leopard had have walked down this road, unless it was like during the rain, it's going to be very difficult to see any sign of them. Lions a little bit less so, I mean they're heavier animals, so a little bit easier to track. And in the overcast light it also further complicates the matter because the tracks are hard to see when the light is flat. So we've got our work cut out for us. I'm hoping Tingana, a big dominant male leopard, pops back onto the property. He kind of was on his route back into this area. He was to the east of us. So that's um, something to think about. Hopefully we'll be able to find the father of that cute little cub. Alrighty. Uh, Virginia, you'd like to know if there's been any action at uh, not just the leopard dens, but also any of the hyena den sites. And sadly, Virginia, it seems like all of the hyena dens that have been used in the past on Juma are inactive at the moment. And I'm, I think there is a hyena den that's active on Buffalzook, the property to the north of us. I have heard a few uh, vehicles calling in on our AF frequency something about a hyena den, but sadly we don't have access to that property. So it could well be that our clan of hyena that ordinarily spent time here has moved a little bit further north for the time being. Hopefully they'll pack at some stage. Nice soft sound there, but no tracks. Our signal's a little bit shaky, so we are going to be sending you back to Noel. Hi, everybody. Sorry about the little gremlins that are popping up. We haven't made it very far since we last saw you. We are just pulling up next to some Impala who are busy fighting with each other, so I'm hoping that they pull their antics for you now. Now, because it's really windy, again, their sense of smell and their hearing is impaired because of this and they're just starting to get their eyesight back as it's just starting to get light so some of the jumping around has to do with the fact that they're excited because they made it through the night and some of it has to do with the fact that they're just nervous in general and also nervous in general because it's a lot of males in this bachelor group so you've got ones with large horns and ones with small horns you've got many different ages in here so sometimes what happens is if a, a smaller one a younger one sort of catches a wobble because of the wind, an older one might take advantage to sort of try and fight with him a little bit. They're not try trying to fight to kill with each other right now. It's more to build up uh, muscle memory and uh, dominance within the structure of the, um, the, the bachelor herd. Beautiful. You can actually see, we talk about it often, but of course we get new viewers all the time and we do do a lot of information, so we'll talk about it again. You can see how these Impala are looking a little bit dark on top. That darkness has to do with the fact that they're cold. It is chilly this morning. I'm wearing a jersey. So what they're doing is they're lifting up the hair around their body. It's called pilo erection. It's a, a specific form of pilo erection. <clears throat> and then the hot air is now circulating closer to the body when they do that. We do similar things when we get cold or scared. The hair on our arm or on the back of our neck stands up and that's a reflex from when we used to be more hairy, hairier um, in our evolutionary tract and, and we needed to, to get warm. Now we wear fleeces and jackets and long pants. Although I'm not a really firm believer in long pants. I like short pants. It's too, it's too nice to wear long pants. Now, <clears throat> Impala are quite interesting for me because Impala haven't really changed over several million years. They had a, an ancestor, antelopes and, and uh, deer had a common ancestor several million years ago and then antelopes uh, broke off and, and deer as we know them today broke off. And Impala, the way that th when they broke off, their structure, their horn structure with the males and the lack with the females and, and their the way that their body functions and all their gland systems has pretty much stayed the same. Uh, they're, they're actually quite a perfect antelope species. They're a medium-sized antelope species. They eat both grass and leaves so they can function very well in the ecosystem um, as long as the drought doesn't affect both both uh, grass and plants and and they do a good job 
Edward, good question. You're curious to know why the Impala have those markings on their bum. Edward, there's several theories behind those markings. One is, is that the black part, so on the sides and then down the middle of the tail, is dark like that to attract ticks away from the very sensitive bum area. Um, obviously, when they, if this male lifts up his tail, <clears throat> And of course he turns around. You're going to see it's um, a lot less fur that's under there and it's uh, the tick load gets in there too much and it's it's too heavy. It's it's bad for them. The other reasoning has to do with uh, flash coloration. So you're seeing the black here and then when they run away they lift up the tail and then it's white and then that attracts either the eyes of the other impala or possibly of the predator. Uh, those those are the sort of theories around it. I I'm trepidatious to say that it's completely correct because we as humans don't necessarily understand everything that goes on out here. All we can do is is postulate. Although the tick theory sounds somewhat accurate to me in my head. But again, I'm not Mother Nature, so I'm not quite sure why she would do that. It's an, it's an interesting thought. I mean, we could come up with our own ideas. I don't know, maybe if you have your own idea as to why why they're like that. Bobby, that's a good question. Is Impala poo like deer, boo, deer poo? <laughs> Bobby, I have not seen deer poo in years, not since I was a little kid. Uh, but the way that white-tailed deer look and how they are structured is very similar to Impala. So I would guess that yes, it is similar. I'm actually looking around me now to see if I can find some Impala dung and I'm not seeing any at the moment. But if I find some, I will um, show it to you and then you can tell me if it looks the same as deer poo. There should be some down the way. Now, we're going to head over. We're almost to our western boundary. I still haven't picked up any tracks. Um, I'm trying to think when this rain came and I'm thinking it was sort of middle of the night and that will help when we do pick up tracks as to age of tracks. Um, obviously anything that's underneath the rain is going to look super old if it's still present um, and anything that's on top will then have a different freshness level even with this wind as well really really fresh tracks won't have been affected by the wind as much um, whereas tracks that have been around for a couple of hours will definitely have been affected by the wind. Now the road that I'm going to travel on just now is super bumpy um, which can make it hard for Ferg to stabilize our, our image on the camera so just take a take a thought on that one as we come down now it's not my favorite road to drive but it is important to check boundaries when you're doing things like looking for lions because the portions that we that we work on they're not small by any means but the lions have a larger area in which they traverse also this is a very good area to pick up on wild dog so I think while I'm busy going down the bumpy road, let's head over to Scott and hope that his traversing is not as bumpy as ours. Yes, it is a little bit less bumpy here and I hope Noel does get lucky with some tracks on our western boundary. Now sadly my game drive radio is not working properly. So I didn't copy any updates about Tingana, but Noel did and apparently I think he has been located and he is in fact heading towards Yuma. So that's some great news. We are going to continue towards our eastern boundary in the opposite direction of Noel. And very often in the past when you would come back into the west from the east you would take this road that we're about to drive on. It's called Central Road. So I'm just going to head towards the junction of our boundary and where this road meets and hopefully he's gonna just pop out straight in front of us and then we can spend the morning with him which will be absolutely awesome so some good prospects okay well Nicky just tells me he's moving southwest but not where from so it doesn't give me too much to work with but at least he's still heading in a westerly direction, albeit south and west. So, good prospects, and even if it means we have to linger along our eastern uh, boundary for a while in the, in the knowledge that he is slowly coming towards us, it will be a worthwhile affair. Another thing to remember is that we are very fortunate by having these small vehicles, so it's quite useful for us to be as close to a leopard as possible when it does come into our property, just to ensure that 
there's a better likelihood of us being able to follow the animal off-road and the other guides not losing it in their big safari limousines which are far more tricky to negotiate off-road than our little vehicles are Woohoo! Haven't found much sign of anything since we've been on the move one or two hyena moving down the roads uh, in terms of their tracks but that's fairly common. Hyenas move huge distances every night in search of possible meals. So you very often see their tracks on a lot of the roads. And it's not necessarily because there's a huge amount of them, but like I said, because they cover large distances. Every evening, hoping to find an easy meal. Okay, Steve, you are wondering uh, about hyena dens, we were discussing that a bit earlier for any of you who may have joined and the fact that none of them are active on the area where we can traverse at the moment and Steve you're wondering why? Um, why would they move their den sites? And one of the main reasons is that uh, animals unlike us uh, don't have to buy property once they've, well, they've, they've got many houses within their property very often let me put it that way rather so, in the case of Aina, they've got multiple spots where that they, they can go and live with on, within their territory. And, you know, they don't have any housekeepers, so they just usually let Mother Nature take care of the housekeeping. And to do that, they need to move out of the den and all the fleas and kind of build up of parasites and their own poop, etc. in and around the den, especially if there's cubs, will be cleaned out by the decomposers and naturally any parasites without any hosts will move off so they're just kind of like chopping and changing and it also means that it keeps any threats to their den you know guessing as to where the den site actually is if animals knew permanently where a den was it would make it easier for their enemies to attack them but if they keep moving their den it makes it a little bit more difficult for their enemies to keep track of the dens so yeah it's not uncommon for hyena to move den sites every two or three months I would say on average but sometimes they hang around for longer there's no set rules It is a pity they've moved off though because they're such wonderful animals to view at their den sites because the cubs are very cute as well as the fact that it allows us a good opportunity to look at their parents. Guide Monkey, you are wondering why we don't go off-roading more in the Sabi Sands seeing as though we're, we're allowed to off-road here. Um, Jeez, I think we off-road whenever we actually need to, so to just drive off-road now in the hope of finding something would be ludicrous. It would be, it would take too long to get from A to B and just to guess that there's something in the block, it wouldn't make any sense just to drive off in there. I mean, if you hear alarm calls and there's vultures, you know, maybe in trees, then possibly you can justify it, but just to drive off randomly wouldn't make sense. Um, and I think we do off-road quite a lot. So give me an example of when you think we could off-road a bit more, Guide Monkey. And I'll possibly understand a little bit better. There's also rules uh, in terms of the off-roading. We are only supposed to off-road for the Magnificent Seven, which is the Big Five, which all of you know, as well as Cheetah and Wild Dogs. So high-profile sightings allow us to off-road. We, in theory, should not off-road for anything else, like these Kudu, for example. And I think that is a good, uh, good kind of rule to work off because if everyone was off-roading as and when they pleased for every single animal I think that definitely would start having an impact on the vegetation so very good now you, these kudu need to be careful because Tingana the big male leopard that we are hoping on finding could well come through this area a little bit later and even though kudu are very large antelope they are not too large for a leopard of Tingana's size and power. Once um, early on in my career in the southern Sabi Sands, the dominant male leopard there caught a fully grown kudu bull. 
which is hard to believe that would have been an incredible sight to see because it would have taken that big male leopard a lot of wrestling and struggling to be able to completely subdue a fully grown kudu bull probably twice the weight at least of Tingana or the male leopard it wasn't Tingana but the male leopard that was dominant down there I forget his name I forget who oh he was the Campan male he was one of the dominant males but then another one came in I think his name was Kashan all righty so we are at our eastern boundary and now I need to try and guess as to where I should go from here whether I should go south or not north Tomorrow you're wondering if there's any updates on some other male leopards, uh, two brothers called Quarantine and Kunyuma, who are about four years of age now, I'm guessing. Um, Quarantine was seen yesterday uh, just in the Kruger National Park, interestingly, um, kind of north and east from here. Um, he came quite close uh, to this actual road we are on, but further north of where we were about two or three days ago, and then from here he's headed further east. I thought I may have heard something, but it's very windy, so difficult to pick up, and I think I was just imagining things. So, uh, yes, quarantine is around. He, he seems to hang around from where we are here to the east. Um, how far exactly, I'm not too sure. Um, I'm not sure when last he was seen on Juma. Kunyuma, on the other hand, he's been, he's been called something else on the, in the area where he's kind of set up shop now. And I think it's uh, further south of where we are. So both of them are still around, but just not in our area of Traverse. Which is sad because I'd love to see the two of them. I spent more time with those two leopards than probably any other leopard uh, in my uh, time with Safari Live. Um, they, they were just freshly kicked out of uh, their mother's care when I arrived here at the end of 2013 and we spent many, many an hour with them. It's quite easy to find young male leopards as soon as they've been kicked out. Uh, not of their mother's territory but out of her care so she'll tolerate them within her territory but she just won't call them back to kills and they'll try and follow her and steal her kills from her and it's difficult for her to tell them otherwise once they've caught wind of her because they're bigger than her so we found that old Q and uh, Kunyuma would spend a lot of time in and around a few water holes they're not too adventurous as soon as their mother leaves them so it made us uh, Made our jobs very easy with finding them. Just gonna have a quick scan of my binoculars, nothing happening up there. And we're gonna wait here. I'm gonna try and get my radio working, get some better updates as to where this male leopard is. And while I try and do some investigation on that matter, we shall send you back to Noel. Hi everyone. So that male leopard that Scott's having a look for, they had last night in Torchwood. So I'm really hoping that he is able to pick up on any tracks that might possibly coming over to Cheetah Cutline side this morning. So I'm trying to look at you all, but also the wind is blowing my hat off my head. So excuse me a bit. And we're trying to track. I'm trying to see if the sticks had decided to come left a hand side from us, which would be, would be north from where they were seen. Um, I'm also wondering where Shadow and her youngster are. Um, I haven't seen Shadow. Actually, the last time I saw Shadow was with you, Ferg, when we came around the corner and she was so lovely to be scent marking. I haven't seen her since then and I'm super jealous of that amazing sighting you had of her interacting with Tundi. Ooh. 1988, you would like us to please remind everybody who is in the Big Five. So the Big Five traditionally, historically, comes from the five most dangerous animals to hunt. It's now the five most charismatic animals to see or elusive animals to see on photographic safaris. There's still hunting safaris that happen, but for us here where we function, it's just photographic safaris. And that is lion, leopard, elephant, buffalo, and rhino. Now the original member of the the big five was the black rhino but we now count white and black rhino in um, in the big five so it can be either but the original was black now one of the reasons why they these creatures were considered it's 
hoodoo. Why these creatures were considered so dangerous to hunt is all of the ones that we listed, the lion, the leopard, the buffalo, the and the, the black rhino. Yeah, lion, leopard, elephant, black rhino. Um, is in, When they're being hunted and they're shot, and let's say you shoot it and you wound it, they're more likely to come and attack you as opposed to uh, run away. That's one, one theory behind it. And then the other is... Uh, for something like a leopard, they're very elusive, very difficult, um, and and so that's why they were considered, from a hunter's point of view, to be um, such such a trophy. Then for us as photographic guides, it's one of those things. I mean, look at how long we waited yesterday evening for that little cub to pop out with Tony. And also, we were chatting. Ferg and I went there earlier, and she was. We could hear that she was around because of the alarm calls, but we couldn't see her. I mean, a leopard can be hiding right next to you, and if it's managed to do exactly what it needs to do with its camouflage you're not necessarily going to be able to see it so that's another another reason why then we sometimes talk about the magnificent seven so you take the big five and then you add on cheetah and wild dog and that would be the magnificent seven um, and wild dog and cheetah are also both elusive but uh, rather than being elusive are slightly more rare and they're not as um, quote-unquote dangerous as uh, the the big five um, cheetah are an apex predator but they're at the bottom end of the apex predators and wild dogs are just above PETA ugh, just above cheetah in that that hierarchy sorry I'm my boxing day voice is not going over very well oh, Debbie you would like to know what are the advantages and disadvantages to bushwalk over driving. Debbie, there are no disadvantages to bushwalks. Bushwalks are the best thing in the whole world. So if if you were going to come over here as a guest and come and stay in Africa at a lodge, I would do as much walking as possible. If I had to pick a disadvantage, it would just be if your whole purpose is to come here for photography, um, then you're not necessarily going to get the same type of photography from on foot as you would get from a vehicle for two reasons. One, you can't necessarily get as close to the wildlife on foot as you can in the vehicle. And two, your um, ability to stay longer with, when you have seen a, a, um, an animal on foot is compromised because you need to get in, view it, and get out without it ever knowing that you're there. Now I say that, but there's a place in Zimbabwe called Mana Pools. It's on the top of my list of places to go, and a lot of the photographic safaris there do most of their photographic stuff on foot. It's super, Ferg and Nikki are going, me too, me too. It's one of those amazing places where for some reason everything's just sort of come together and you get these crazy elephant and wild dog sightings whilst on foot. Um, I couldn't tell you the background as to why. I haven't been up there myself. I actually need to contact, I've got a friend that has a camp up there. I need to contact him and ask him what his thoughts are on that. Um, so that, that would be slight small advantage over disadvantage. Debbie, it also depends on where you're doing safari. So we get um, a lot of questions about where should I go and are these good choices. It depends on have you been on safari before. It depends on what do you want to see. Um, it also depends on your budget and it depends on what country you, you feel like going to. There are places I would send birding guests that I'm not going to send guests who really want to see lion. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's different, different than that. Um, I actually have an email that I have to respond to uh, since I've got back from leave going over this, this sort of uh, scenario and idea about where to go on safari. Now one of the reasons why this, the Sabi Sands area or the Greater Kruger area, the Lowfeld area, is a place that I would send guests, whether you're first time guests or repeat guests, has to do with our concentration of wildlife. I mean especially the, the viewers that have been watching us for years and years and years, you know the type of wildlife that, that we get here and we get really great sightings. The only downfall to the Lowfeld area, in my personal opinion, is that in most of the places where you go on game drive here, you not always, but you sometimes have a time limit, say 10 to 20 minutes on a sighting, because of the number of 
vehicles that need to need to come and see the animals as well. I'm not saying that it's like a zoo and you're just going to see vehicles everywhere. That's not what I'm saying. It just you have to be aware of everybody else. There are other places where I've worked in other African countries where um, you don't you don't necessarily have that that scenario. So you have to be very particular in which lodges you pick. And when I say which lodges, it's not just which lodges, but you want to go to a place that has really excellent guides because that guide is the one that's going to be able to mitigate all those little um, sort of borders and barriers that we have to work with and you're never even going to know that they existed. So again, you guys are always welcome to PM me if you have any any thoughts on where you want to go. If you've already booked your holiday, I can't really do too much, but if you're thinking of booking your holiday, I can give you some suggestions. Um, and you have to be really honest with yourself as well. You have to really say, I'm coming to see Leopard. Don't do one of those things where you're like, oh, well, Leopard would be nice, but secretly inside you're going, oh, I just want to see Leopard. You have to say that because that really dictates where you would go and where either myself or your travel agent or a friend of a friend or whomever would um, would send you. So I am feeling like I want to go into the Mulwati. So anyway, that's a super long-winded uh, chat about safari. <laughs> Philip, super interesting question. Philip, you're asking, does a bushwalk count as a vehicle in sightings? So Philip, when we're doing walks, we're trying not to engage with vehicles because you cannot be on foot in a sighting with vehicles and be safe, if that makes sense. If you're watching lions and you're standing on this bank over here and there's three vehicles here, it's it's a bad scenario for you on foot. And then also those lions with the vehicles there are more aware because of the sounds and things. And and also it takes away from the experience. Who wants to go on a bushwalk and, and come in contact with cars? It does happen every, every now and then, but the whole point of being on foot is to be away from everything. It's on your own two feet, you're lower down, you're smelling your hearing is completely different. Um, it changes your bushwalks change your life. A proper bushwalk done done well changes your life. So one of the things I really love to do when I do bushwalks with my guests is I don't actually talk a lot. We walk and it's not a march. It's a it's a slower walk because I have to be aware of everything. And I will stop every now and then and give little bits of information, but I'm quiet a lot because you want to really shut off and take in all all of all of the the sounds and the smells that are going on and you can't do that when I'm talking your ear the whole time the other reason why I like to be quiet is one it helps me hear the wildlife but I've had many occasions where um, you know we've been doing not a completely silent walk but almost a silent walk and managed to have the most amazing elephant sightings and rhino sightings and I've also been on walks where we've been a little bit more chatty obviously in quiet voices but but yeah there's just something about shutting up and just being here and being present in the moment. It's, um, I don't know if any of you have been following that uh, movement that's resurged, uh, the mindful movement, you know, being mindful about what you're eating and how, how you're functioning and, and what you, being, being mindful of in the moment of where you are. Bushwalks are like that. All right, our gremlins are now coming over to us, so let's head up to Scott and see how his tracking exercise is going. Well, so far we have not come up with any tricks, but what we're hoping is that Tingana would have continued towards our property. I got a bit of a mixed message. He essentially was heading south and west yesterday evening. He hasn't been found this morning. So I've checked one portion of our uh, eastern boundary, kind of to the north. No sign of him there, so now I'm going to check to the south, where there's actually more likelihood that he would have popped out somewhere here <coughs> in terms of the trajectory that he was moving on when he was last seen at some point yesterday evening. So we'll just cruise along here. There's another vehicle that's checking the southern boundary. We're running on a road parallel to that, but still definitely in an area where he could poke his head out or at least we could find some of his tracks. So I'm really looking forward to spending more time on foot with you guys as Noel and you have been discussing. It really is a magical, magical experience to be out on foot in Africa. And I've been loving being back in the vehicle to be honest, but it's nice to mix and match and do a little bit of both. 
Jason, you're wondering if there's areas uh, that we can go to on bushwalk where the vehicles simply cannot go. And yes, certainly, there's a number of places where, you know, if we were to find a leopard kill, for example, there may be no way of getting a vehicle in there, and therefore the only way of being able to get a view would be to head on with the bushwalk backpack, depending on what the sighting is exactly. So it is possible. And no one's found your bird, so why don't you rush off and enjoy? So this is a very special bird. Anthony, this is a present for you. I have a friend who still has not seen a gray-headed kingfisher. Here you are. There's your gray-headed kingfisher. He's going to say it doesn't count because he's not here. So the beak is red on top and red on the bottom as opposed to having black on, on either side. There's more black on the wings as you saw there. Oh, it just went and caught an insect. It just went right directly behind. I can just see him a little bit there, Ferg. See here? There. Perfect. So he caught an insect, and then can you see how his body's functioning? He's actually hitting that insect against the branch. I don't want to move the car because I don't want him to fly off. But there you can see those little jerking motions. And then the, again, the darkness on the wings and just a little bit of blue on the, on the outside primary feathers there. And then you saw that very rufousy, um, orangey bottom to the breast there. Um, he's also known as a rufous bellied kingfisher in other parts of Africa. Um, oh, there he flies. Oh, and there he lands beautifully. Sorry for our aerial. Ferg has basically turned himself all the way around. And then there he is, you can see him nicely again. So we see these gray-headed kingfishers in this area often in the summertime. Well, I say often, I've seen them quite a bit, but again, I was just talking about my friend. He's been guiding for 25 years and he still hasn't seen one, so everything is definitely relative. And as with most of our kingfishers, this is an insectivorous bird as opposed to a bird that eats a fish. And so he was just grabbing something flying out of the uh, bank of the, the Mulwati there. So any of the birders that are out there, we're getting some really wonderful screenshots this morning with this particular gray-headed kingfisher. The last one that I saw uh, with you all, the, the light was not as good. Now something that I'm noticing around his head as he flies off there is that the plumage was a little bit um, scattered and um, not as consistent. So... I'm having a feeling that um, it either got super wet or that it's possibly just coming into its adult plumage. Um, and then Nix, I'm sorry, who's loving this? I miss the names. Dina and Guide Monkey, you're really enjoying that very bright cobalt blue uh, feathers on the back there. There's a little bit of a iridescent twinge to it that gives it a somewhat violet color towards towards the ends there. It is a beautiful, beautiful bird. And it's nice with this overcast sky, it's actually bringing those colors out nicely. Now that little insect that it just grabbed and ate recently... Um, it uh, is not. It's not going to be enough. It's going to need to keep, uh, keep going on and hunting and and looking for insects and foraging, because that's how it's going to keep its energy levels up. So earlier in the morning it was a bit too cold, and now it's just the right temperature. Jamie, you're curious to know if the female is as brilliant. So Jamie, yes, the female and the male of the gray-headed kingfisher look exactly the same. There's no sexual dimorphism, so she does. She looks just as pretty. Oh, fantastic bird. I love kingfishers. I also that love that little head movement they do going up and down and up and down. Now with this sort of cooler but also warm weather the insect populations are going to be moving around nicely so part of the reason why the kingfishers sit the way that they do in the vegetation that they do is they're accessing areas where there's either going to be insects that are flying by or possibly insects that are climbing um, along along the ground there and which makes it easier for them to dive down and uh, grab them quickly be very similar to the movements of the pied kingfisher where they hover over the water looking for fish it's the same sort of idea Jason, interesting question. You're curious to know what is the evolutionary purpose of those vibrant colors? Now, Jason, if the male had different colors to the female, I would say because it was because of breeding. But for me, with bird colors, with evolution, 
I honestly, it's similar to why does a water buck have a circle on its bum? I mean, some of them, like Birds of Paradise, they did that wonderful uh, documentary, the David Attenborough, The Life of Birds, uh, with all the different little mating displays, and then later on went back and used a UV um, filter, and they were seeing that there's actual patterns on the feathers that are in UV. So those d those those mating displays have a lot to do with showing that that UV light as opposed to um, anything else. Uh, but why as to having those vibrant colors oh there's a beautiful little blue wax bill anybody's guess it could be just because nature wants every little bird to be different um, if again if there's sexual dimorphism it's to attract a female but you know lilac breasted rollers for instance both males and females look the same um, with this little blue wax bill both males and females look the same so I think it's just one of nature's gifts of here we go we're a bird we're pretty and let's see what sort of spectrums of the rainbow we can come up with to be honest with you if there's anyone else there that that has a more scientific thought on it. I'm more than more than um, open to hearing that. Ooh, having a little bit of a bite there. So this bird is not an insect eater. It is a um, grass eater. So you see it's coming up to that little bit of grass and picking off the flowers, the inflorescence, and eating them. Yeah, Nix is just commenting how the beak has a sort of purple tinge to it, and it does. It's sort of a, a gray slash purple slash mauve color mixed in there. And sometimes you'll see with birds that have no sexual dimorphism, uh, when they do go into sort of breeding, sometimes the color of their beaks so a little around the face has a slightly darker or different tinge color to it as well. Now, normally when there's one blue waxbill, there's more. I'm not seeing any more at the moment, but Ferg managed to spot this beautiful guy off the back of the car here, and now he's telling me that he sees a few, a few more. So that's that's good. That is how they usually function. Can you all hear the bird sounds in the background? I'm just going to be quiet for a sec. So we were talking about walks and doing silent walks. So that's kind of what it's like is you, you are walking sometimes and sometimes you just stand still and it's the bird calls and it's the wind pushing through the leaves it's, and it's all the smells that come with it. This morning, this soil has a smell after it gets wet, this, this soil inside the Milwaukee, this um, riverbed soil. And it's... I want to say it's like wet dog, but it's not bad like wet dog. It, it's it's prettier, it's hardier, but it's very pungent. And there's our kingfisher again, <laughs> still looking for a meal. Jeanette, very good question. You're curious to know if there's albino birds. So Jeanette, there's no albino birds, but there's leucistic birds. So leucism is a lack of pigmentation, which gives the white coloration, but the eye color is the same. You also get melanistic birds, which is an over pigmentation, which would mean that the bird is all black as opposed to being having having any color. So I've seen I've seen photos of leucistic forktail drongos. I've personally I've recently seen um, a melanistic pied babbler and melanistic uh, uh, gabar goshawk. Um, trying to think. Yes, there were some crazy photos that were coming out a couple of years ago with some um, melanistic and leucistic uh, uh, colorations. You'll also get, Jeanette, you'll get leucistic buffalo. Um, so it's a white buffalo, but again, the eye color is the same. And then you'll get albino elephants. So usually with birds and with hooved animals, you get melanism or leucism. And then with um, something like a pachyderm or with us, uh, those types of mammals you get albinism. So if this kingfisher were to be leucistic, he would be white everywhere, where all those colors are. And if he was melanistic, he would be black everywhere. Although I've never heard of a melanistic or leucistic kingfisher. 
All right, Scott's got birds doing something else other than hunting insects, so let's head on over to him and see what's going on. I'm not too sure what is going on here. There's some guinea fowl that I've heard alarm calling. You can see two of them there. They've just stopped alarm calling, and then there was another one up a tree. So I'm not sure what bothered them, whether it was a snake in the grass or possibly a leopard. I'm hoping it is a leopard. And I have noticed one or two kudu moving through the vegetation in the background, so maybe this leopard has got an eye on them, if there is in fact a leopard here. I'm possibly getting a little bit ahead of myself. Oh, it's my one of my favorite things to do is to follow up on alarm calls and We've driven off the road uh, into the area where we eventually found the guinea fowl, but now there doesn't appear to be anything here. Maybe they're complaining about the miserable weather. Huh. Now the fact that we did see one up the tree makes me wonder. Often when they see predators that can, that are kind of ground dwelling like a leopard they'll naturally fly up into a tree because they'll feel safer there and of course if it's a bird of prey they'll usually stay down on the ground where they can hide and scurry off into the bushes a little bit easier so hard to be certain what it is that got them going oh big hole Hello BK, you would like to know how many different species have I ever seen in one particular sighting? And yeah, there's some kudu that are running up ahead of us. I think it's just the windy weather. They would ordinarily alarm call it something if they saw it. But let's just keep creeping along. Maybe we are lucky, maybe there's a predator here. Um, the most animals and species in one sighting, I, I don't remember counting a set scene, um, but the Maasai Mara is a very good place to see multiple species in one particular spot because you can simply see so far from any given spot because it's so open there. And you also get a few other kind of desert sea, very dry areas where with a little bit of water at any water points you can also get a huge amount of mixed species but but yeah in terms of the most species in one sighting I can't uh, come up with a with a set sighting nothing comes to mind we've had some fascinating sightings though of lion, leopard uh, and hyena all in one sighting, elephants coming past, but the most would have just generally been, you know, general game, Ellie's, Topi, Grant's Gazelle, Thompson's Gazelle, white bearded canoe. It will generally be the plains game all congregating together that brings you your biggest multi-species sightings. I really thought those guinea fowl were going to lead us to some treasure, but I think it was a false alarm. Maybe they were looking at a bird of prey or something else. I guess a uh, guide monkey we were discussing off-roading earlier, and this is a good example of where, you know, as soon as I thought that there was a possibility that we could find a big cat off-road, we, we squirreled in, but no joy. So now we're going to squirrel our way back out and onto the road, and then come up with the plan C or D. I'm not sure how many times we've changed the plan already this morning, but it does change quite a lot. On safari, there's that's one of the realities. You kind of head out in the morning with the general idea of what you're going to do, and then very often the plans change quite quickly. Although I'm thinking as a, as a kind of vague plan, I'm not sure how long it'll take me to get there, but I think I'm going to slowly start making my way back towards 
Tundi is Dan Sites. If any of you are new viewers, Tundi is a female leopard who's got a tiny little cub. And I did pop in there a little bit earlier this morning. That didn't sound good. Uh, I did pop in there a little bit earlier this morning, but there was no sign of the mother. So hopefully she will be back from a successful hunting mission and be back at the den when we next poke our nose in there. Wunderbar, we are going to make our way back towards the road, or at least attempt to, and send you across to Noel, who's, I think, in a little bit of a better situation to receive you than I am at the moment. Hello again. <laughs> Wunderbar. I love that you said that, Scott. That's one of my favorite expressions. I've had some really amazing um, German guests over the years, and they always said Wunderbar. I love it. That and Freedom House, which is the name of a a bat. I love it. I absolutely love it. Okay, we are gonna go check Chitwa I think. I think that's where we're headed, and we are going to see. We might get a little bit of funny signal dip it, um, just here uh, when I go through this little dip. But just hang on, it'll pass over soon. And again, sorry for the back of my head. My hat's flying off. James, you're curious to know, are there any summer arrivals, so any migrant birds that come to us in our summertime that seem less scarce? James, I've barely seen any carmine bee eaters um, yet down here. I saw a whole bunch in Zambia when I was up there because obviously they were breeding there. So it feels like they're taking a little bit to get down the side. I saw one or two in Shuvakani uh, about a month or so ago, but other than that, I haven't really seen much. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm de definitely missing them. And then. We were chatting a couple of years ago with some friends of mine about the downfall, lack of, is that lack of, I like that better, lack of um, sort of s swallows that are migrating down. And there's an interesting scenario that happens up in the northern sub-Saharan Africa where um, subsistence farmers put up big nets to catch birds because they use them to, as food and that's actually affecting some of the migratory bird population numbers um, just as a, as a side thought so not seeing as many of them as we, we used to see um, and then obviously James we're still looking for that silly Colossus cuckoo I have heard and seen it a couple times but we haven't gotten it on camera so I am, I'm hoping maybe today is the day maybe today is the day we'll have to wait and see Okay, so now as I'm driving around, I am keeping an eye on, on all of you and talking to you as well, but I also need to look around quite a bit. It is really good um, weather for movement of predators of any kind. And then with the wind picking up, all of our prey species are going to be hiding a little bit more. So I need to check inside the bushes and check under trees and, and things like that. Um, I haven't really, other than our big male elephant that we couldn't show you but that was around earlier, I haven't picked up anything on, on fresh on Ellie's, so as I say that, there's some Ellie's that have moved around when it was wet back there, heading sort of in this direction. Matthew, you want to know how we tell how old tracks are? So Matthew, if you ever paint um, wet paint is wet paint and it glistens and you can tell that it's wet and then as it dries that wetness fades and it starts to um, uh, sort of peter off and, and get a bit more dry looking. It's the same with tracks. Fresh tracks look fresh and then obviously wind and uh, sun and time starts taking away all the, the detailed edges and that's how you tell, how you tell the difference. We're just checking in. I wonder if when we get to Chitwa Dam, if there might be elephants around in there from the signs that I'm seeing. But we will have to wait and see. We're Again, we're on our southern boundary here, so it's a little bit corrugated, a little bit bumpy. Guide monkey, you're curious to know are there any species that thrive during drier spells? So guide monkey, there are species that thrive in drier climates, most definitely. Everything has to fit its niche and everything is habitat dependent. Um, here in sort of drier weather, I think everything just sort of makes it through, but they definitely prefer the more sort of lush, slightly 
slightly wet weather, but in general, South Africa is an arid area. Um, we have parts that get more rain than others. Um, but when it's too dry, uh, it's not it's not really good for good for much. That's for sure. Ugh. So windy. Well, there's elephant dung in the road there. Lady Starfire, you're curious to know when is the rainy seasons in Juma. Lady Starfire, we only have one rainy season and that's our summer and that's now. So it's rainy season now. So we start getting, we should have rains come end of October all the way through to February roughly. Um, it's changed a little bit over the years, obviously with climate change and things like that, but that's our rainy seasons, our, our summertime. Then um, that's most of South Africa, excepting the western side, Cape Town area, they get winter rains. So that has to do with, uh, South Africa has a large escarpment that goes over most, most of the interior. Everything sort of on the escarpment and east, the escarpment and east uh, has uh, summer rains and it's a dry winter. And then everything on the western side is, is uh, a wet winter and a dry summer. <laughs> Thanks, Hank. I'm glad you're appreciating my very long monologues this morning. I always... <laughs> Thanks, Ferg. I always, I, I always have trouble when we don't see things because I don't know how much you guys want to hear me waffle on about whatever we happen to be waffling on about. But I'm glad to hear that it's working for you, Hank. I'm very glad about that. All right, well, we're coming up to Chitwa Chitwa Dam in front of Chitwa Lodge. Um, and I'm not seeing elephants at the moment, but when we get up to the dam wall, I'm going to stop so that I don't have to drive and try and hold my hat and look for all of our species. And then we'll just have a, a wee look around and see what's potting. Maybe we get lucky and Hasana wants to pop up. I haven't seen Hasana in forever. He's stupid. I've decided that he's the new cheeky one. So Tingana and I have an understanding now. I sat with him for quite a while when we were doing rehearsals for our TV broadcast with Nat Geo Wild um, that happened on the on the um, 15th for us in South Africa, but the 14th for you in the States. And um, so we've come to an understanding, Tingana and I. Now Hasana is my next one. And I have not seen Tamba at all. I would really like to see Tamba. So he's on my list. Oh, we have hippos. Everyone loves a hippo. Every time we've got a tree that we just passed by here and it's the tree that James Hendry climbed up and talked about eating the leopard orchid and he wants to see Scarlett Johansson. And now every time I pass by that tree, that's all I can think about. All right. Hello, hippo. Sitting here nicely on the edge of the dam with your little head popped out. And of course, as we zoom in, he's probably going to dive under as they like to do that. They're also cheeky like those bull elephants. There we go. Now hippos, oh, there's two of them. Hippos are the mammal that loses the most moisture through their skin than any other mammal, which is one of the reasons why they have to be in the water so much is so that they can maintain their, their moisture content. Um, these ones have gone under. We've got a couple more over by the island. And then I saw a few more sort of tootling around in the back. There we go. They look like little rocks in the water, but there they are. The light is uh, difficult for viewing hippos in the dam this morning because the color of the water and the color of the sky are basically the same and so it, it mutes everything and gives it a very flat coloration. What is that bird that is flying over them? Ferg, I think that's a turn. Ah, oh, it might be a whiskered turn. Um, oh, you've got it, of course, you're brilliant. So turns are water, are, are water, are birds that you'll see along the edges of the water, um, sort of fresh water as well as um, sea water and in estuaries. Uh, waders and shorebirds are by no means my strong point. Tristan is much better than I am at it. But there he's landed. It looks like he, it's a, it's a bit far off, but it looks like he's got a black head and there was black under the 
value there and it's still 2017 so I can still um, go off uh, you're reading my mind um, uh, Nikki I do have a book I'm just looking now as I'm chatting away I've still got birds that I want to tick off for this for this year and it is definitely a whiskered turn I called that one fantastic okay so you see here with the whiskered turn that um, uh, Ferg will get to just now. We don't want to give you guys epilepsy with our with our camera movement here. Black, black back head and then dark underneath here um, with the um, adult breeding colors and this would be a, a breeding time for this for this whisker turn this this summertime here. Um, the only the only things we couldn't see from the distance would have been the red beak and the red legs but the way that it was flying and the wing pattern most definitely if it was a white wing turn which we get here in summertime we would not have seen sort of the the, the dark uh, belly there in the non breeding but then have a look at the breeding do you see how dark it is everywhere and that one distinctively had a dark head with a bit of a breakup and then dark again fantastic that's my first whiskered turn for the season I'm going to add that one down. That makes me super happy. I need to add up my bird list um, for this year. I think I'm going to have to start doing that shortly because we only have a few days left in the year. I cannot believe it's almost 2018. I'm astounded. Okay. I'm not hearing any elephants. I'm not hearing any lions. Say one more time, Ferg. Where? If we go up. Ferg says he can... Huh? <laughs> Ferg said he can see a playful hippo. We have to go up onto the, the wall, but he says obviously, oh, when we get up there, he might stop. Let's see if he does it again. Samwell, good question. You're curious to know, are hippos endangered? So Samwell, I don't think that they're on any of the red data lists as far as I know, but of course we're going to have people out there who will be able to quickly Google that and double check to see if I am right or not. But I also don't think that we are fully aware or fully um, care as much about the numbers because of scenarios that are happening with things like elephant and, and rhino. When you get one or two species that are really having a hard time, people tend to focus a lot on just those one or two species and other species tend to sort of fall through the cracks. So we are losing water courses and we are, I mean, there's obviously there's pollution issues uh, across the continent, just like everywhere in the world and um, with seasonal changes and dams being built. So I would assume that yes, there is a possibility that the hippo numbers are much lower than they should be and they are an important part of the ecosystem especially in places like the uh, the delta the Okavanga delta and botswana i mean they really these hippos are hysterical <laughs> they, they really um are important for the ebb and flow of the nutrients under the water and mixing things up and when they're walking around and and how the islands form and things like that um, but i couldn't give you the actual specific what the iucn thinks about hippos on that one. I can do my homework and get back to you tonight. I love when you guys give me homework. It forces me to, to become more smart. Look at these hippos. They're having a ball. Jason, you're curious to know if hippos are safe from predators whilst in the water. Um, yes and no. Uh, crocodiles, large crocodiles, can definitely get uh, towards small and, and medium-sized hippos. Look at them. Do you guys? So what they're doing under the water here is they're running along the bottom and jumping along the bottom. They're basically chasing each other. So if this was elephants, we would see them chasing the, each other around and wrestling. But, <laughs> but these ones are under the water, so that whole scenario is happening under there. That one just dunked the other one. <laughs> Um, and sometimes baby hippos, Jason, sometimes baby hippos are um, can be killed by other hippos, uh, female and male. I've seen it happen uh, within a pod, especially when the, the water starts decreasing in, in certain areas. Um, so yeah, it can happen, but it's most of the predation would occur outside of the water. I know Ralph's been watching those lions up in the Maasai Mara um, that have been eating that hippo carcass, so I would assume those lions got that hippo uh, when it was meandering about and grazing outside the water. I'm enjoying these two little hippos and their shenanigans. And they, they popped up quite close to us here, and I think they realized that <laughs> we were watching them. And now it looks like they might move over to the rest of the pod or the raft.
Sounds man, fantastic. 207 with that whiskered turn on your bird list. I love it. I love when you guys get some new ones ticked off there and added in. Morning, morning glory. You're at 252 with the whiskered turn. Well done. I like it. Great stuff. Oh, Lucy, you're the winner for the morning. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. You're at 315, 315 uh, with that whiskered turn. Well done. So I'm assuming that's not for the, the, for everyone that we just got there, that's not for the year. Are those your ultimate bird lists for Juma or is, is it just for this year? I'm curious to know from anyone there. We'll wait for you guys to answer. There's more birds down here where we see those little um, croc hatchlings. So I think let's head down that way. All right, let's head over to Scott and see if he can find you some interesting birds to add onto your list. And don't forget to let me know if those numbers are for always or just for this year. And we'll see you shortly. Well, I've never heard of a whiskered turn until this morning. So, well done, Noelle, and very happy that she's got a lot of you an extra bird for your bird lists. Now, I know you're discussing also the migratory birds. James Richards asked if there were any kind of usual migrants that haven't arrived on time. I think the white stork is possibly another migratory bird that should have arrived by now, but I haven't seen one of yet. It's not to say there haven't been any here, just I haven't seen any. I did see one pair of carmine bee eaters on the Buffalo Hook cut line, probably within the first two weeks of my arrival uh, in the beginning of December. and. Haven't seen any since, although when Nikki and I drove out of the reserve yesterday to go and drop off Amanda, our taste engineer, she cooks all of our tasty meals for us, and I saw a few just outside the reserve. They quite often like to perch themselves on power lines, telephone lines, any lines that we've put up because it's a good vantage point for them to just kind of sit at a height where a lot of insects are ordinarily flying and then they can just swoop off, catch them and fly back and land in the tree. So they often perch themselves higher up in trees, like kind of dead knobthorn trees or anything like that. That's where they usually like to perch themselves. And I'm wondering if it's not because we've had a major lack of rain here that a lot of the insects that would ordinarily be in this area aren't. They're not erupting and emerging as they ordinarily would, which leads me to think that the migratory birds are making hay or making the most of other areas. Hmm, I can't think of any other migratory birds that we're missing. I'm sure there's a couple. Haven't seen many lesser spotted eagles. They usually come in onto the scene for our, our summer months. Who else is there? Probably a whole bunch that I just can't think of. The one I'd really like to arrive the most is the carmine beater because they're just such spectacular birds. Very, very beautiful. Oh, well, I guess Wakesha pilots jumped to the fact that I was chatting about Amanda, our chef, a little bit earlier. And you'd like to know, how was our dinner last night? It was absolutely wonderful. I think we could uh, classify it as a seven-star meal. And we had Conrad, one of our technical wizards, uh, on Bry duty. He was the Bry master, which is a it's a it's a it's a major major responsibility, having the tongs in your hand and being in charge of flipping the meat at the perfect time, as it roasts over the coals. And Conrad did an incredible job. Not easy to bry for a lot of people, especially on a hot summer's night in the low felt. So, yeah, we had a wonderful, wonderful dinner. 
We actually cooked everything over the fire because the oven was playing up. Or we basically just didn't know how to get it to work. Amanda, Amanda does, we don't. It's a bit of a temperamental gas oven, I guess. So we didn't want to blow the kitchen up. So we cooked everything over the coals, even the vegetable dishes. We just put in tin foil and cook. We cooked everything in and around the fire. Except for the sweet potato mash, that was done indoors. It's a very nice mash. Jared and Ashley took care of the sweet potato mash. And we had a righteous, righteous feast. But to be honest, we did celebrate our Christmas uh, a day early, a day or two early. We had, Mexic we had a Mexican themed uh, dinner on our Christmas nights. We didn't celebrate Christmas yesterday. We was it the day before Christmas that we celebrated, or two days before? Either way, we've made the most of it, and we've had pre-Christmas, during Christmas, possibly some post-Christmas celebrations today. Who knows? <laughs> All righty. <laughs> You're wondering if there have been any snake sightings today. And no, there haven't been today. I don't think there have been any the entire month. I'm lying. I got to see one brief, or show you guys at least one brief sighting of what I thought was a stiletto snake or a burrowing asp on a bushwalk. And no joy with the snakes. I mean, in all the time I've spent in the Sabi Sands, I've seen very, very few snakes. And if I was to put it in kind of uh, um, a ratio, per month, I would say, we see one, well, I guess you'd see maybe one snake every two months or three months, on average, four or five sightings a year, not more than that. It obviously depends on luck, and you could see all three sightings within a week of one another, but we have sadly very, very seldomly see snakes here. One of the best opportunities would be for us to go and catch snakes that are found in a camp and need to be relocated to a more appropriate place out in the bush and then we could show you the snakes once we've relocated them. But I guess we've got quite a lot on our plate so it's to start being an armed well, not an armed response, but a snake response unit to go and try and catch snakes would be adding a little bit too much to our plate racing around the Sabi Sands, but I'm trying to think of how we can improve our snake sightings. Alrighty, well I'm gonna head up to the den site of a leopard now in the hope that she's returned, and while we do that we will send you off to a bird that is hunting. We have a hunting great egret. It just caught a little fish now. So great egret might be another one for your bird list. And I'm glad to hear that those numbers you were giving were over the years. That's absolutely fantastic. I would be interested to know if there's anyone that uh, has a bird list just for this year for South Africa and what those numbers would be. This great egret is another one from my list for this year. I haven't seen one this year yet. And notice how he's, remember their eyes are on the side of the head. So notice how he's positioning his head and his neck so that he can see down and into the water a little bit there. And then he spears the fish with his beak. And sometimes he uses his feet to push up the fish and sometimes he's just angling himself so that he can stab them and eat them. Ooh, nope, he missed. And just behind him, there's some Egyptian geese there. This guy is very active in hunting. Obviously, look, it's a cooler day, um, but it's still summer, so it's not cold, cold. It's cold for, for me and Ferg, but it's not freezing cold. Um, so that there's a lot of, oh, looks like, there, there, he got something. Now he's swallowing it. It was a tiny little fish. This is fantastic. Um, so there's a lot of insect and fish activity, and of course, the bird activity along with it. And here in the shallows, there must be a lot of um, smaller fish, maybe little baby tilapia, also known as bream. I 
I wanted to catch a bigger one just so you all can see see the fish itself. He's got a beautiful snowy, snowy white plumage to him. And with the coloration of the water and the sky today, it's popping out nicely. Now, one of the reasons why I say this is a great egret has to do with the fact that his legs are black on the top part there and his beak is bright yellow. Oh, he caught something. Did you see that there? Oh, very nice. Michael, you would like to know if I've seen any violet back starlings yet this season. Yes, indeed, I have. Um, I think Tristan showed one on air several weeks ago, but I'll see if we can find some more to, to show you um, possibly today. We'll have to wait and see. I've seen a lot more females than I have males this year. The males are beautiful. They used to be called a, pl called a plum-colored starling. They have a beautiful vibrant violet uh, plumage. The females are, are very boring brown of course. This guy is really going for it. Hiss, you're asking what are the differences between an egret and a crane? <laughs> <laughs> Super interesting question. Off the top of my head, I'm going to assume. With body structure, I mean, herons and egrets are very, very similar. Um, our national bird is the blue crane. Let me see if I can just find it for you quickly so that we can see while we're talking. Um, and again, you've given me some homework. I also think it has to do with what they eat. So I'm pretty sure that the cranes eat quite a lot of insect um, matter as opposed to fishing around in the water like this. Um, so we're just gonna leave our fishing bird just for a second and we're gonna come over to the book. All right, so we get um, gray crown cranes in parts of South Africa, but you would see them up in the Mara quite a lot with Taylor and with Ralph. And then here's the blue crane, here's our national bird. Now, usually when you see these two birds, you're seeing them, there'll be water around, but they're sort of out in the grasslands and picking up insects. Now, as opposed to this great egret that we're looking at here, we also get the yellow-billed egret and we get little egrets here, these three, this side. They're gonna wade in the shallows of the water and fish their food out um, and have aquatic creatures for most of their diet, as opposed to, look at the beak structure with our cranes here, it's much shorter, even though they've got the long legs and a similar body type that's gonna be more of a, an insect or snake and, and, and more terrestrial food sources. So now that we've talked through it, I'm guessing those are the differences, to be honest with you. I would think that possibly their nesting behavior and where they put their nests is slightly different, but I would have to double check for you on on um, those, ones, those ones there. Now we also have somewhere here, is he gone? We had a cattle egret. Um, one of these ones down here. We had a beautiful little cattle egret, but he has, uh, he's meandered off, unfortunately. And then we also have some really beautiful white-faced whistling ducks that are just busy at the edge here that are stirring up the vegetation and picking their way through that vegetation. And also I'm pretty sure that they eat a few snails every now and then, freshwater snails. And they're called white face whistling ducks because they have a white face and they whistle, funnily enough. And of course they're not whistling for us now because that would be too easy. <laughs> yeah. Daniel, you're curious to know what's the difference. Yes, you guys are really working my bird knowledge today. You want to know what the difference is between a tern and a gull. So I'm just going to get, while you guys are looking at the ducks, let me just get my book organized. So, Daniel, terns are much smaller than gulls. Also, their wing pattern is a, a little bit different. 
Let me just find our turn and then I'll find you a gull so you can have a look. Um, and I would also assume that their nesting patterns are different, different but the same. So <clears throat> here is our whisker turn that we saw this morning is just here. Notice it's got quite short little legs, short little beak, small head, and then longer feathers along it. Then a gull that we would see here, um, possibly at, at a place like Chitwa Dam, would be a gray-headed gull. So notice how it's got a much thicker neck, it's got a longer neck, a bigger head, a longer beak, and not as long with, with the feathers there, and then longer legs. Um, so again, it's just fitting a similar niche, but also just acting a bit different so that they can both be in the same area without um, competing with each other too much. But again, other than that, other than the sort of uh, physi physiological and, and, and morphs, um, morphological uh, uh, parts of it, I couldn't really honestly tell you off the top of my head the difference. I can go and have a look-see and see what we can find for sure. I'm also trying to see, is that our, is that a dick up or do we have possibly our heron is back at the edge there? It's a little dick up. There's a water dick up or a thick knee that's just at the edge of the water there. Busy scouting around for food. We had a green-backed heron that was around that likes to hunt along the edges here, but he's also moved off a little bit. And then every now and then we're getting a view of this tiny little baby hippo. Tess, you're curious to know what is a hippo's mating ritual? So the male will come up behind a female um, after she's gone um, uh, sort of wee or or um, defecated in the water and he'll test her her pheromones off of that to see if she's ready to mate and then he'll sort of follow her around and try and put his head on her rump and then if she is not sort of running away from him and this is all happening in the water if she's not moving away from him he'll he'll rest his head there and then he'll mount her and and they'll mate like that and then he'll move off and be in his territory and she'll give birth several months later in the water and then she'll nurse in the water as well so this female that we're looking at now is the one that's usually on this side of the dam and she's got that little baby with her I know during the TV show the little one was climbing up onto the mum quite a bit but today is very windy and cold so that we've just seen on the, her right hand side so the back side to our screen he's popping up every now and then there oh now he's popped up on that side instead very well there we go. So he's under there. He's probably looking for a bit of nursing and just keeping himself warm. So let's head back to Scotty D and see if he's had any luck at that den site with Tandy and if we can maybe see that little cub today. Sadly, no joy. So Tandy must be out doing two things, either trying to get herself another meal, busy hunting, or maybe she's made one and she's made a kill and she's busy snacking on it. And I mean, to give you an idea of what may happen is like one morning the tracking team found Tandy as she made a kill and it was early in the morning at around 7 o'clock and she stayed with that kill until quite late that same evening. So she could be gone from the den site for the whole entire day. And of course it's still worth our while to po poke our nose in every now and then to see if she hasn't returned. But the reality is she could spend 12 hours away from that den trying to get her next meal. So I'm thinking what to do is just kind of go for a drive around the area where we've been noticing Shadow, Tandy's sister, has been, has been spending a lot of time. So hopefully we'll be able to find her. I'm desperate for some spots this morning. And also I'm, we'll be quite happy to be able to find something and stop and look at it because it's quite a cold windy morning. I didn't bring enough layers. Lady Starfire, you would like to know which animals in general have got mating seasons or breeding seasons. A lot of the birds will only nest in the summer months. 
so the birds are a species that will be quite specific to kind of making the most of the summer bounty as well as a lot of the herbivores especially the herbivores with a gestation period of six months or less which is most of your general game then you start getting animals like hippos rhinos elephants We've got long gestation periods and even though they are herbivores it makes it difficult for them to plan exactly when to mate and therefore obviously when they will give birth. So yeah then a lot of the predators don't although wild dog do interestingly all other predators are a lot less bound to kind of mating seasons but wild dogs tend to den in South Africa in and around March which is quite interesting but as a, you know the predators have always got access to to food of course there is a bounty of youngsters which are easy to cash in on during the summer months but they don't plan their birthing around that so they for their mating I hope that helps Lady Starfire. I guess a lot of the insects through default because they're most active in summer will also be mating in the summer months. So I think I've covered a lot of the main species we get out here and families rather of animals. If there's any others that you can think of that you're wanting to know about do, do shout and we'll get on top of that. Philippe, you are wondering if the senses of the prey species will become heightened before or during stormy weather. And I guess it's not that their senses will become heightened, they'll just be on higher alerts. It's not like their senses will become any better. They'll just focus more because they'll be naturally more scared because any little sound they hear or any little bush they see waving in the wind, they may presume to be a predator. So, so I think, yes, I think they're definitely going to be a lot more skittish and nervous in stormy weather. And their senses will definitely, maybe, I mean, I guess there's, I mean, I guess it's just, yeah, maybe their senses will become height, uh, heightened forward slash they will just be on higher alert. I just don't know if they have the ability to increase their level of being able to smell simply because, or hear, simply because the weather's bad, but they, like I said, are just going to be more tuned into their senses. Ah, very good. We have found a diker who seems to be chewing on something. Don't know what it is you're chewing on. You have got a mouthful there. What have you found? Is that a marula? Oof! Well, you swallowed. Are you chewing the cud? What you up to, buddy? Have you got the hiccups? <laughs> no, I'm not sure because I definitely swallowed something and then continued to chew. That's kind of not really underneath a marula tree either so I wonder what it was chewing on I've never seen a diker with a mouthful that big before made me get a little bit hungry myself to be honest I wonder what's for breakfast today hmm So some of you guys might remember this little story I'm about to tell you. It was back in the days of quarantine and Konyuma. <clears throat> and when I was still very new to Safari Live. And basically, we had been following tracks of a young male leopard. We weren't sure whether it was quarantine or Konyuma. And there's another road that runs, there's a small riverbed here, and there's another road that kind of runs down and connects up ahead. And we saw the tracks coming this way in this little riverbed. So I drove around and then came down this hill and I parked the vehicle probably right here. 
and then I jumped out to check if any of the tracks had come out through this drainage line. So as I jumped out the car, quarantine popped out from right here, literally. I mean, I think the bushes were a bit bigger. And then he ran up and kind of just waited on the side there. Thankfully, I was very close to the vehicle. Oh, excuse me, the vehicle. Now I've got the hiccups after that diker. The diker gave me some contagious hiccups. <laughs> But that was a wonderful morning. Happy memories. Lots of happy memories driving around this place. Very good. Well, it sounds like Noelle is still at the Chitwa waterhole and she's found you guys a very cool bird. I am Scott. I'm loving your story, by the way, of getting out of the car and almost on top of quarantine. We've got a little green-backed heron that's here um, that is busy in the backside of the dam. This is sometimes where we see Hasana. I actually came back here because we see painted snipe back here, and I'm not sure if any of you have painted snipe on your life list or on your year list. I saw him a couple of weeks ago, so I got to tick him off, which was good. This guy is busy hunting. So we're going to watch him for a little bit. And I'm just keeping an eye on... There's tall grass sort of at the edge of this little marshy area. Um, and I'm just keeping an eye there to see if this painted snipe will will come out and show itself because that's a that's a big one. It's also one of a one of the birds that's a lifer type bird. Uh, I've had guests before that have come to join me on other properties that I've worked um, looking for painted snipe in particular. Now we watch leopard stalk quite a bit and we watch lions and cheetah stalk, but now you're watching a greenback heron stalking his prey, and it's a very similar movement. Look how he hunches himself down and look how. Slowly and surely he puts his feet 